uh, I will stop sharing this one. And then. Yeah, go here. So this this works as an excellent bridge, as I was saying to. Really the the introduction of embedded systems, right? Uh, uh, so well, embedded systems are everywhere. You guys did excellent in, in pointing out examples like game consoles, uh, airplanes, cars. Inside cars, in fact, currently modern cars, you might have around 100, well, what people call um, ECUs or, or well, more or less. So it's like microcontroller units, right? Uh, well, industry, uh, robotics, uh, well, mobile phones we have already mentioned, uh, so uh, smart TVs, well, all of these are really embedded systems. So what really defines an embedded system versus a general purpose system? Can we consider really our own laptop as an embedded system for our desktop, right? Most likely not. And the reason is if something that is used for general purpose, not part of a bigger system, that is this likely to be called an embedded system, right? Uh, embedded system, what, what, what kind of distinguish it from general systems is that they are designed for a specific purpose and they are embedded inside a bigger system. They interact with the physical world, right? Um, if we think of really the history of computing uh, in 1998, which is how long is that ago? 23 years, might be 24 years. This was the first year where really the embedded processor shipment has surpassed the PC shipment, right? Before this PCs or personal computers were really the dominant of the computing system market. In 1998, surpassed it for the first time. Well, look into the trend. Embedded processors, well, right now, they are really all the general Berbus, uh personal computers are less than 1% of the market, right? So embedded systems are composing really a huge, well, majority of the computing systems. Looking into the future, people are envisioning that this is, well, it's going to increase, not, not decrease. And this is thanks to some of you already highlighted the IoT revolution. Uh, which are forecasted to have billions of units by 2030. Uh, autonomous cars um, will have more than 100. In, in fact, currently, even with with not full autonomy in modern cars and 2020 cars, we have more than 100 embedded processors. If we go to full autonomy, this is well, it's going to increase, right? So embedded systems are are, are sub, well with all the intelligence that we are going uh, around us. They are supposed to be the future of competing systems, right? Uh, again, looking into the history of, of computing, we started from very big devices. That's well, one of the earliest actual computers, which is a Colossus uh, computing system. It, it was as big as a room, so you had to walk in inside the room of the computer to deal with it. This was in, in 40s. And then in 80s, we started having what we call personal computers, right? With, this is one example of this, which is one of the famous ones back then, IBM Akron in 80s. And then well, starting with 90s, we had the laptops. And then in early 2000s, smartphones came into effect. And then in, in, in 2010 uh, decade, we started having wearables. And now in the near future, well, the revolution is we just have embedded systems everywhere, right? Everything would embed some sort of intelligence uh, to be more convenient. Again, I'm showing here two examples. Those slides are really from, from industry slides uh, here automotive you can think of so many ex examples of processors around your car that has either uh, partial or full autonomy and then inside your home you might well you give the examples of thermostat and um, and and the other uh, more like electrical devices but it's it's, it's going to become more right uh, and, and that's the expectation and well one point that motivates why we should study embedded systems is if you look into this trend, we are moving from this kind of general self-contained, self-independent, general purpose computers into more like intelligence everywhere where we have embedded systems controlling our lives, right? Uh, having this picture bigger for IoT, think of your home, you'll find so many examples, like gas leaking sensor, smoke sensor, IR cameras for security, well, smart TVs, home servers, smart outlets, uh, thermostats, even smart, smart windows, well, smart homes is, is, is one of the marks that people are, are, well, it has been a buzz for a few years and people are still looking into it. 
automotive cases, maybe a more aberrant case because everyone is rushing towards uh, full autonomy and then autonomous cars. Uh, and if you look into an example, this is an actual example from, from an industry, you'll find that there is a centralized CPU cluster with so many AI machine learning accelerators, and there are multiple what we call gateway processors where you collect data from sensors, you collect data from your cameras, from radars, from leaders, and then you do some sort of processing and then send them to your central CPU and might also communicate it either to another vehicle or to a, a cloud service based on the use case. All of these are embedded processors because they are embedded inside your car. And one good feature about embedded systems is you shouldn't be knowing about them as a user, as an end user, right? No, I'm not talking about an engineer learning about them, but as an end user, if you start knowing about them, that means something wrong is going on, right? For example, if you start feeling that, oh, this camera is not working and I, I need to take it to, to, now it's not the mechanic, but the, the electrician or the computer engineer to see what is going on, that means there's something wrong with it. So as far as it's working seemingly, that means, well, as a user, you shouldn't be caring, it just works, right? Good. In all these examples we have given, um, well, embedded systems, they have one additional feature that is very important, which is interacting with the physical wallet, right? It's why you might hear in the news, or if you read any scientific articles, people call these cyber physical systems. Why cyber physical systems? Because there are two components of the system. There is a cyber component, which is the computer itself, like the processing element, that's more like the, the cyber part, but there are sensors and actuators that really deal with the physical wallet, right? collect data from it, sense it, process it, and then modify it, right? That's why it's called cyber physical system. Cyber physical systems, well, they integrate so many components, really both from the physical wallet and the, the, the cyber or computation wallet. Uh, they are more or less embedded systems. Uh, interaction with the physical environment is really a first class citizen. It's something that you cannot, and that's a very important distinction between embedded systems and general computers, right? Um, is that you always interact with the physical wallet. Uh, this leads to a few challenges as we will see later on. Safety is one of them. Well, self-driving cars is, 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 is in the news. Any, any accident that Tesla is involved in, you hear about it because of the safety issues, right? Um, and the, the main goal is we, well, the, the success of cyber physical systems is well, people are envisioning this to happen throughout the co-design of the cyber and the physical parts of the system. And well, this requires what we call in, in the engineer of a system of systems. An embedded system right now is no longer a single simple system. It's really, well, there is a cyber system, there is a physical system, there are multiple layers as we'll see, and you need to integrate all of these, right? Why I'm saying all of this kind of background? Because this course will focus so much in the systems aspect of an embedded system, right? The course is deliberately meant to be a systems course where it integrates and consolidates multiple knowledge from the full stack that we have discuss, like discussed so far, right? Uh, again, some more examples. Uh, again, healthcare, automotive, uh, well, uh, smart infrastructure, robotics, industry, what people call industry 4.0, uh, uh, avionics, all of these, again, are cyber physical systems. Well, the important thing is that their features if you think about an, a cyber physical system, well, you do four things, four main things. And in fact, you guys will be doing this in the lab, right? You will sense the physical wallet through sensors. You will communicate the data you sense it into your processor or microcontroller. You compute while well, doing some actions based on, and I will have examples later on, uh, if, for example, you are reading some data from a gyroscope, which you will be doing in lab one, if I remember correctly, uh, you have to do some calculations to see really what it really means. What is the tilting? What is the um, well acceleration might be for an accelerometer? So you, you come up with useful knowledge out of the raw data. That's the compute part. And then you actuate, you take an action in the physical wallet, right? That's the actuation part, right? Uh, um, some more cyber physical or embedded applications, they are really kind of, of the drive for so many revolutions in many fields. If you hear about smart power grid, if we have someone here from uh, electrical engineering, we have few. Uh, well, smart power grid is really controlled by this intelligence. Again, if you find any intelligence in a system, this is most likely is caused or thanks to uh, embedded systems inside it, right? 
Uh, if you want, for example, to predict and respond to varying conditions in supply and demand of power, do it intelligently. Um, that's that's used within embedded systems. Uh, if if you well, if you are in biomed, uh, integrated operating room, instead of all this mess of so many distinct devices, if we have what people call well, that's currently a, a cable mess. If we have uh, what we what people call the integrated operating room, where you have a centralized intelligent engine of an embedded system, and then you have a plug and play functionality of different devices, right? Uh, for monitoring and then taking action as well. So well, we 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 have done so many promises. Uh, let's come to the challenges, right, or the requirements uh, to have a safe, well, to have a well and a successful embedded system or cyber physical system. You need different things. First and foremost is safety, right? All such systems, if you interact with the physical wallet, well, failure is not just as having a, a shutdown in your laptop, right? If if your if your Word application fails, well, hopefully no big deal. You might just lose some of your work, but that's really not, there is no catastrophic consequence for this, right? But if your airbag in your car, well, doesn't work properly, that means well, that might lead to life losses, right? Uh, think, for example, about a, a base maker for for uh, um, a person with a heart problem, right? If it doesn't work as intended, well, we might lose the life with this person, right? So safety is a first class citizen of embedded systems, especially those interacting with the physical wallet or what we call CBS. And then another important point that highlights embedded system in terms of safety that the system correctness really does not only depend on the functionality, but also in the timing aspect of the system. If you go back to, well, uh, could you have written into SH or 2SI? You have been focusing on functionality, right? So for example, do I produce the correct result? Well, do I do it correctly? Does it work as intended? But timing was really a less of a concern, right? But in, in real life, well, again, I would take the example of airbag. I don't know if I have the, um, hopefully I, I have I have this this animation later on. If you take the airbag, if the airbag works from the functionality perspective correctly, which means it opens if there's a crash, but it opens in the wrong time, well, the airbag itself might really kill the drive. So the, the correctness of the system, what is written here is a very important terminology in embedded systems. The correctness of an embedded system does not depend only on the logical or functional results, but also on the timing aspect of these, of these, uh, of these results. And I hope that's clear. So let me stop here because I have been talking a lot and, and take a few questions if there are questions. Is this timing aspect is correct? Uh, is, is is clear for for correct functionality of an embedded system? Because again, we'll be focusing on this a lot in 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 labs and in the hands-on experience we have in the projects. Questions? Feel free to use the mic. And yeah, something also I didn't mention. Okay, maybe it's 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 my mistake. I jump it directly into the motivation, and usually this is how I want to do it. I do the motivation first, and then jump into logistics. But something to let you know in is really my style in, in on online lectures is do the following. I I well I talk for about like around ten minutes more or less, and then I look into the chat to take questions. Right. So feel free to use the chat to post questions. I this is the reason why I have another device looking directly into the chat, uh, and then I will stop frequently and take them. If you want to also use the mic, feel free to use this. I I, I really like and enjoy interactive lectures rather than just being a, a one sided talk, right? Uh, Gordon, are these slides posted? Um, I will post them on Teams after this lecture, uh, and hopefully if Avenue is, is fixed today, I will also post the lectures on Avenue. Um, but until now, they are not posted because Avenue has a technical problem for the course. Is there any other question? Again, feel free to jump in the chat, write anything uh, to me and or use the mic if, if you prefer to use the mic. Regarding the timing aspect you mentioned for the output. So to be clear, it's not just the logical design and the timing, but um, how, for the timing, the way that it's measured, do we measure it in cycles or like, because you gave the car bag example, right? But the timing on that might be unique on each given set of inputs. So effectively, when we're measuring this, will we have to have like a cycle measure? Like, will we have to have like, um, how much about this? An encapsulated system around it in order to measure the timing as well. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, so 
Timing is really a big research topic on its own. In fact, some of my research interests lies in this. I guess the question goes to the point is that how really timing is being measured? Because while it's use case dependent, 100% agree. But in this regard, what people in industry and academia do for measuring time is Let's, let me use the same car example because that's an important and I hope later on I have the animation. Let me see. Maybe I will just use it directly in, in this. Uh, yeah, good. So uh, let's do this and then come back to the performance and uh, interoperability later on. So let's take the airbag as an example. OK, the airbag control unit in your car. Well, the ACU. It controls the mechanical part of the airbag. The way it works, it's it's a real time task, so it, it's being activated frequently. OK, just to check and sense the real wallet. And well, you can imagine that it really has to be activated in a very, very small millisecond window. Otherwise, it might lose a crash. And then I do all the parts we have done for the embedded system. You do sensing. If you detect through your computation that there is a crash, you need to do the activation part, which is in our case, opening the airbag, correct? What we mean by time and correctness in that case is that this task being a real time task, it has to do all of this within a certain period of time, which what we call a deadline, right? If all of this happens, if the sensing happens fast enough and the computation and then opening the airbag once a crash is detected, uh, detected happens within a certain time window, the airbag will open in the well, assume for example, a crash happens, the airbag, if, if it all finishes before the deadline, it will open in the correct timing and then it will save the driver life. This is functionally correct because, well, we did it, we correctly detected a crash and we did the actual the correct actuation, which is opening their bag. But it's also timing correct because all of this happened within the time window that I will come into the use case point, right? Which is how how the time window is being determined. It's being determined by designers when the well and also certification authorities where they tell you your airbag to be certified for use in actual cars it has to do this within a period i don't know if one millisecond right and they do a lot of heavy testing to measure it in worst case scenarios right but but i will touch a little bit more on on this later on but right now what we care about is that the timing is also correct because it finishes before it's the dedicated deadline on the other hand assume well a crash happens but the problem is that to be able for the compute, computing unit to take the crash, it took more time than expected. For example, the algorithm written in your ECU take more time than expected. In that case, it exceeds deadline. What happens is that, well, it opens later on, much later on, within outside of the window frame that is given by the designer or the certification authority. And in that case, it doesn't open in a timely manner and we might lose the driver life, right? So when we say the timing aspect, we mean we really mean in physical life, what is the requirement such that the system works as intended, right? For example, an airbag, uh, for it to work correctly, well, again, designers and, and um, well, certification authorities, they might say, well, Airbag in a bona crash, it might it must open within one millisecond. That will be is going to be your deadline, right? It might vary based on really the crash. It, it might really sometime the airbag opens in uh, let's say 0.5 millisecond. It might open 0.75. But as far as in all possible scenarios under testing, the open before the dedicated deadline one millisecond, which is the worst absolute deadline, you are safe, right? So yes, there is a runtime variation based on the use case scenario, even for the same use case, which is the airbag, based on how the crash really happens. But as far as far as you are less than your deadline, if you finish here, we do that. If you finish here or here, well, you are safe, right? So always, and and, and later on, we have really dedicated slides for talking about this predictability concept of embedded systems or the timing aspect. Usually the timing aspect compare it to general purpose computers, which care about the average case. For example, if you are watching Netflix, well, as far as the streaming is in a timely fashion, if a bucket drops or, well, 10 millisecond delay might not affect too much. So this is usually referred to soft real time. As far as good average performance is happening, great, no problem, right? Gaming console is the same thing. But here, it's not the case. Here, I don't care about the average case. I care about the absolute worst case. Right, which is under all possible scenarios, I should never exceed my deadline because this will lead to live losses. Right, and this is how we measure really whether the timing is correct or not. 
are you less than or equal to the deadline or not? I hope I hope this clarifies a little bit uh, uh, the, the 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 concept of this timing. Beer is saying effectively a margin of error with a hard limit. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yes, the, it gives you a window that as far as you execute before it, you are safe. So there is definitely a margin. In fact, it's a, a practice in uh, automotive industry, especially that they add what they call plus or well, let's say plus for now, plus 15 percent of margin on top of their measurements. For example, if they de design an, an airbag that they know that under all exhaustive testing they have done in the lab, it really finishes in, let's say, uh, 0.75 millisecond. What they say is I add a margin of error. For some just safety reasons, and then I increase this by 15%, right? In some more critical systems, they really might just increase it by 50% if they are not very sure uh, of their testing techniques as well. I hope this clarifies that does this clarify the concern maybe in, in, a, in a brief thing. Hopefully we re retouch it back again when we talk about the timing aspects. Good, and then performance. We said safety is the number one requirement, but you still really need to achieve sufficient performance, right? Uh, we, well, if, if, if I give you an example of a car, a car is a very complex system of embedded systems where, well, yes, worst case for the airbag is important, but also the average performance of your infotainment or GPS or connectivity is also important, right? So modern embedded systems, they don't only have real time requirements uh, or breakability requirements, but also they have high performance requirements, right? And then one big problem currently, and, and again, automotive might be the best example of this, is the interoperability. What do we mean by this? So looking into the car industry, in fact, well, Toyota, for example, or Honda, like they don't really manufacture all the components of a car, right? This never happens, right? They deal what they call o OEMs, right? Well, those are the third party companies that they are specialized in manufacturing different car components, right? Bosch, for example, from, from Germany is one of the, the most famous ones. Uh, well, NXP and electronic uh, electronics, um, TI, for example, like the different uh, electronic, well, or maybe I would say used to be uh, computer engineering tech companies right now, also part of the OEM industry of the automotive because of the connectivity we're talking about and the intelligence. All of these, they are specialized in manufacturing different components. Now, when it goes to Honda, for example, they want to certify the full car, right? go to the certification authority, tell them we have this new model for 2022, we want to certify. But the car might contain really components from 20, 30, 50 different third party companies. How all of this really operates together, right? This is what we call integration or interoperability. And, and that's a very, very big issue from security, from safety, and, and that's the system of systems perspective of things, right? OK, so the summary is we need predictable, secure and verified cyber physical systems, right? Predictable, we have already went through the example thanks to the question. Uh, predictable here means you always satisfy your timing aspect, right? Well, showing an example again from industry. Uh, this is a company, if I remember the name is called uh, Auto AI or something of that sort. It's a specialized company. Uh, yeah, here the name is is AI Motive. They they build systems for uh, for autonomous cars using AI, right? So what, from one of the slides, this is in 2017. They highlight that really going from a traditional car, maybe the ones that we own right now, into a self-driving car. One of the big challenges is really having a safe and real time requirements, right? So predictability is one of the biggest challenges facing uh, industry right now. Going to the second example of IoT, here I am getting this from Global Foundries, which is one of uh, the companies that well, manufacture the wafers we have been talking about before, um, similar to TSMC and Intel. Here they say definitely for IoT systems, uh, you do a lot of data analysis bandwidth, uh, it's very important, but you have real time and actionable insights, right? So think, for example, and you need to change something in your well, there is a security alert, for example, or there is a smoke that is detected in your in your house. You need to take an action, right? And this action has to happen in real time. Otherwise, well, 
uh, a fire might just come to the house, right? So, so those actionable insights that must happen in real time, but a constraint on the system that didn't exist before, right? And that's the predictability side of things. And then another important point uh, that uh, that also we would see in hopefully in the lab is this concept of systems on a chip, right? Uh, I no longer have well separate ECUs for cars, for example. If you think about Tesla, and in the later lecture I will show you the Tesla chip. Uh, Tesla, one of the big innovations they have done in the cars is moving from having hundreds of OEMs that we have been talking about from processor side ECUs. They move to what they call centralized SOC, the Tesla chip, right? Uh, which is a system on a chip. You put everything in a centralized fashion, which increases performance and predictability at the same time. Uh, well, why why this is needed? Because of the challenges we are talking about. We said there is a performance challenge, there is predictability challenge. I give you here a few examples from modern systems. If you think about like an, an F-22 uh, fighter, it has around 1.75 million line of code. If you think about an, uh, like a, a traditional uh, uh, passenger plane, it has 6.5 6 million lines of code. But if you think really about one of the S-Class Mercedes cars, and this might be a surprise for, for you, it has uh, it has much more like it's not an order of magnitude, but it's more like here. It's 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 really around the two orders of magnitude, like 20, right? Uh, 20 X, well, not 20, maybe 15 X more lines of code. But you might think really a fighter is much more complex system than than a, a consumer car, right? Is there any hint from your side? Can you think of why really we need this so much line of complex algorithms and coding in a car that we don't really need in a fighter? Is there any justification that you might come up with in in uh, why we need two, 20 million lines of code versus 1.7? Comfort features, that's one. That's one that might be a one. There's a lot of variations in on the road, so like real life scenarios, there's a lot of variables to account for. 100%, thank you. So can I ask who said that? Uh, uh, my name's Jairaj. Jairaj, okay, thanks. So in fact, Jiraj, uh, I would appreciate, well, this is one other things I do usually in logistics. I, I ask questions and if I think the question is really challenging, I, I ask you who answered to send me an email with your name because I add bonus marks at the end for interaction. So Jiraj, please do this. And also, um, M. Klimanowski also said more use cases, which is identical to what you said. Please also send me your, uh, send me your name as well. Kyle is saying that they are highly trained. That's correct. Uh, Jesse also use a variation. That's that's also correct. So please also send me your name. Uh, so yeah, well, look into the cars uh, in the road, dealing with pedestrians, other cars, weather conditions. All of these are really undetermined environment, which makes it much more complex. And with this in in mind, you can understand really why having autonomous trucks in the highway currently are more successful than just having a full self-driving cars or autonomously driving on highways is considered to be much safer than driving on actual streets. Again, because of the number of use cases, there are no traffic lights, uh, there are no pedestrians, so the use cases are much less, right? If you read about autonomous cars, you will find really, well, highways are, are, are the friend of, of self-driving cars. Good. So, well, here again, unlike traditional simple, very simple embedded systems of microcontrollers, because this is one of the mis uh, uh, convention again about embedded systems. People 10 years ago might be used to think about embedded systems as very simple microcontrollers, um, I don't know, BEC or AVR, 8-bit, that really handle very simple use cases, right, in breadboards, right? It's, it's no longer the case. Currently, embedded systems are much more complex. They interact with the physical wallet. They require very high performance, as well as they have a very complex sensor processing and sensor fusion. Again, we will touch on this later on in, in the sensor lecture, as well as in the lab, uh, where you really need to do a lot of uh, processing, uh, uh, well, computations to be able to detect the data from the sensors and take the action. Uh, in in real uh, in real world, I guess also hopefully in in the second project we will be reading from cameras and we will do a, like uh, uh, obstacle avoidance or or track following based on this. Yeah. Then the second important challenge that I want you to understand in embedded systems or modern cyber physical systems 
is you no longer have a simple type of task, right? We give the example of the airbag in a car. We said, well, it's a very critical task. Safety is a first class citizen. But if you think about a car, in addition to this airbag and maybe ABS engine control, which are very highly critical tasks, there are also other well, list of a critical tasks, something like the navigation system, the instrumentation cluster, the cruise control, they are usually referred to as medium criticality. And even we also have lower or non-critical tasks at all. Well, air conditioning, right? Uh, this is more like convenience. As people said before, there are some kind of con convenience tasks running there. Connectivity, infotainment, all of this, well, it's good to have. It's it's a luxury feature, but if we, if we have a, a, a failure, the consequence of that failure is not really life loss. So how to know whether a task is critical or not? Think of the consequences, right? Criticality is really a function of the consequences of the failure. If the air conditioning unit in a car fails, well, okay, not a big deal, hopefully. You still have some time to really pull over and, well, try to fix that. But if airbag fails, well, you can think of really what bad consequences we might have, right? So the mixed criticality in nature of embrace systems Boots in mind really well when you do the scheduling, and this will come more when you talk about Artos and Lab 2, you need to take this into account. Task priorities, what tasks are more important in terms of criticality and how to handle them. Okay. Let me just check the time. Yeah, okay, 12. Okay, that's that's good. Um well again, when I give you a challenge, I always want to reflect this in industry, right? What what people in industry are thinking about this. And and this is a title of a talk from ARM. Uh, well, ARM is really the, the, as I said before, it's it's the it's the owner of the instruction set that is, that is really used mostly in embedded systems. It's it's, it's almost the, the biggest company there with their license uh, structure. Um, they have a title of, of of a talk talking about automotive. They say, well, we need to enable mixed safety critical features in automotive, right? They were targeting automotive in that case. And they state during this talk that increased, this I guess was in 2018, and then they state clearly that increased need for performance and mixed criticality as we move from assisted, which like this is the era we are in right now, it's called assisted autonomy, uh, where the driver is less, is still involved, which is like, uh, think about autopilot in, in, a, uh, in a Tesla car, for example, to full autonomy, right? So moving from here to there, you need really to enable dealing with the mixed criticality tasks we had uh, with, with the example we just gave right now, right? Other examples from other industry, this is from Synopsys. They mentioned that functional safety is one big challenge. We already talked about this, but they also mentioned that uh, you really need, well, you have functional safety, but you also have quality of service, which is, well, the average performance case. We have mixed criticality in nature, right? And here I told you that in cars, there are multiple criticality levels, tasks with different criticalities, right? Um, in fact, in the car industry, there is the standard, it's called the ISO 26262, which has what people call different ACL levels or different criticality levels. It defines, uh, well, the ACL, I guess, defines five criticality levels or four, if I, I'm mixing it with the DO87 uh, DO from, from avionics. One of them defines five, the other one defines four. Let me see, A, B, C, D, E, yeah. So the automotive one is defining five, right? So wh wh what it means by defining five ACL levels? Each task in a car, each component in a car has to be certified with certification authorities according to a certain level. Again, the airbag, for example, has to be the highest level, while infotainment unit may be the lowest one, right? But anything, you, you must have the certification. And by the way, certification is not only for cars. Well, any medical devices, sensors has to be certified. Avionics, the same thing. Uh, in fact, in trains, even there are like anything that really involves dealing with the actual wallet. There is a certification authority in different parts in the wallet. Uh, well, in the European Union, in, in North America, there are different certification authorities that, well, it's illegal really to put this in a car, for example, without being certified, right? Uh, that's from Synopsys. Uh, I hope by now you already know Synopsys. Uh, NITSPEED is an, another company that, that, well, it's get acquired by Intel, I guess, in 2019, but they also mentioned that you have different requirements, mixed criticality. You have the real-time processor, but also you have the performance requirements. And then finally, again, ARM, they make it very clear that really there is a widespread or spectrum of requirements going from high performance and 
up to the real time, safe, secure, responsive, reliable systems, right? And here they give you the examples I, I gave you, right? They say, for example, the high performance ones or the less critical ones, infotainment cluster, driver assistant, vehicle interface, user experience, all of this as well. Good quality features, but not very critical. While talking about the real time, safe, secure, responsive, reliable, fast port. Uh, well, again, airbag might be here. Uh, ABS might be here. Uh, the engine control unit also might be here, right? So different parts of the car should be certified differently. And that's a big challenge because again, putting all the systems together, how these interact together. I will give you examples later on from real life, how really putting mixed criticality tasks in a car uh, might lead also to security issues, okay? Um, and then, well, as Tesla, I guess, uh, devoting this, the solution to all of this is really the system on a chip, right? Having different processing elements, uh, similar to the example I show you, I, I have shown you for, for your mobile phone, for the Snapdragon system on a chip, you have different processing elements. Those can be CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, ASIC, anything. They share some sort of resources and then they execute different tasks. Why what people are arguing that multiple processor system on a chip should be used for modern embedded systems? First of all, there are much lower cost. They provide high performance. They are energy efficient. They provide a low time to market because I can license to those RIPs, right? Uh, so, well, here is an example from a very uh, famous lecture uh, in 2017 by Hennessy and Patrice. And I would really, uh, if, if you have time, I would I will put the link for this talk. Turing uh, Award is considered to be the Nobel Prize for Computer Science and Computer Engineering. And it was given in 2017 to Hennessy and Patrice from uh, Berkeley uh, for their, well, computer architecture, uh, 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 well, innovations. You, you might have already been like uh, having a textbook from them in, in your, uh, in, in your 4DM course, because their textbooks are the mostly used in, in computer architecture. Anyway, so what part of their talk was really touching on this heterogeneity of the system on a chip. They say, in fact, that to enable this golden age of intelligence, you need what they call DSA or specific domain, domain specific architectures, right? Where you, well, I design a processor that only handles, for example, image processing. This might be a GPU or even a DSP or a different ASIC processor. I design another processor that handles machine learning. Think, for example, about Google TPU, right? And then I have still my general CPU that handles well, the normal daily tasks, right? And all of this will be just on the same chip, right? Uh, again, in the, in, the, in the picture we'll see later on uh, in another lecture for, for the Tesla SOC for the car, you will find that it really applies this concept completely. If we go back to the Snapdragon chip I have shown you uh, from the mobile phone, that most likely every one of you already have, have a Snapdragon uh, system on a chip in their phone, whether it's Apple or Android, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it also has this concept, right? I showed you the GPUs, the CPUs, the DSPs, right? Uh, there are also FPGAs. You might be surprised that there is an FPGA in your mobile phone. Why heterogeneous stuff? Why really domain specific architectures? Because if you remember, we mentioned one of the challenges of embedded systems is in the mixed criticality nature, right? I have different tasks that have different requirements. Some of them are very critical. Timing aspect is very important. Others are less critical, but they require high performance infotainment, for example, right? If I have a heterogeneous system, I might really design or tailor my processors to match those, right? To give you an example, here, uh, well, let's jump these examples from industry. I want to go directly to an example of a system on a chip that is targeting automotive. That's from Zazalinix, um, which is like the biggest FBGA manufacturer right now. They have this ultra scale uh, plus architecture targeting automotive. If you think about it, they have ARM R5 cores. These are real time processors, dual core, very simple and they can handle real time tasks, right? And they are certified for certain um, for, for certain tasks in automotive, for example. But on the same chip, they also have the Cortex application processor, which is a very high performance. ARM used this word application to mean high performance general purpose architecture. They also have, well, safety reliability requirements. They have GPUs, right? Uh, and then they have the FPGA, right? So heterogeneity is an example of such architecture. Here is another example from another company. I guess it's a Japanese company, it's called Renesis. If I remember correctly, they have what they call the real-time domain, 
that's for the safety critical tasks and the application domain is for the high performance tasks. 